let's start with a quick review of some of our forces. I have a 1,000 gram mass, and if I set that onto the table in front of me, pause the video, take a moment, and draw a free body diagram of what's going on. So I've drawn my work table, and I've got a mass here. And I know it's 1,000 grams, which is 1 kilogram. And I know that the force is equal to the mass times the acceleration. So the force of gravity is 1 kilogram, that was my mass, multiplied by the acceleration due to gravity, which is 9.81 meters per second squared. So I'm going to draw my arrow. My force of gravity equals 9.81 Newtons in the downward direction. But that object is not moving. It's sitting on my desk. And the reason it's sitting on my desk is because my desk, according to Newton, is putting an equal and opposite force. So in the upward direction, I have a normal force of 9.81 Newtons. These two forces equal opposite directions. The normal force is perpendicular to the surface of where it's resting. Next, what I'm going to do, I'm going to take the same 1,000 gram mass, but instead of setting it on the desk, I'm going to hook it on to a string and dangle it. We haven't done one of these yet. Can you draw a free body diagram? Back. I have drawn a little stand on my workbench. And in blue, I've got the string coming down attached to my weight. There's still gravity acting on this object. The force of gravity has not changed. It's 1,000 grams. So we have 9.81 newtons of force of gravity pulling it down. That's going to exist everywhere on Earth. Well, I know gravity is slightly different other places in Earth, but but on Earth, we're going to have the mass times the, the gravitational pull, the acceleration 9.81 meters per second squared. If that is the only force, then the object would fall. So there must be, according to Newton, some other force. And it must be equal and opposite to the gravitational force. If this force here was bigger, the object would rise. If the upward force was smaller, the object would fall. But the object is not moving. We saw it. I hooked it onto the string. As a result, the string must be providing some kind of force. And that force of the string is what we call the force of tension. And as we already mentioned, it must be equal in magnitude. So it's the same number, 9.81 newtons, and it's in the opposite direction. Next, what I'm going to do, I'm going to take a frictionless pulley. Now, it's not perfectly frictionless. But I'm going to hook that into my stand. This time, I'm going to take two 1,000 gram masses, hook them together with a piece of string, and I'm going to put that over top of my pulley. What do you think is going to happen? Now, what you can see is that they do not move. The two weights are stationary. I know they're just moving a little bit. Just a little bit of wind in the room here, and I bumped them a bit. But they are not moving. They are stationary. So we can figure out the tension that's in the string. You can also notice that if I slightly give it a little push, here, watch this. I'm going to give that a little push down. And they keep moving down. And the reason it stops is because there's a little bit of friction in my, in my pulley. This pulley system that we had here is referred to 
as an Atwood machine. If we were to draw the free body diagram, here I've got my, my blue, or sorry, my black pulley, and the green represents the string, and the green represents the two masses that I had hung off of it. And we can calculate the force of gravity for each of those. Once again, it was 1,000 grams. So I'll call this on the left, I'll call this M1, 1,000 grams. We convert that into kilograms. And we know that force is mass times acceleration. So once again, this has a downward force of 9.81 newtons due to gravity. For the exact same reason, M2, because M2 in this example was also 1,000 grams, one kilogram. So our second force was 9.81 newtons. Remember that the pulley simply is changing the direction of the forces. So what we have is we have to have an equal and opposite force. Once again, we have this force of tension here. I'm going to call it FT1. Oh, sorry, that should be force tension 2. And that has to be equal and opposite to the direction of the force of gravity that's acting on this mass right here. Likewise, over here, I have a force of tension for mass number one, and it is also 9.81 newtons of force in the opposite direction of the gravitational pull. So this is the tension in the string. What we have to realize and remember when we have tension and string is that it's going to be equal on both sides. The tension in the string is the same. Now, this is based on one thing that we have to assume is if the string is weightless. And the reason we have to think of that is, is that if one of the one of the masses here was pulled down lower. If the string was heavy, that would make this side heavier. This side would become lighter because of the weight of the string. If the string has no weight, then the two sides would be equal. But the tension, the tension, oops, I said tension is string. Tension in the string Tension in string is constant throughout. So what I'm saying is, is that because we have a weightless string, the tension here and here and here and here is the same as it is over here and here and here and here. The tension in the string does not change. The first one has a mass of five kilograms. And I calculated out the force of gravity would be 49.05 newtons. I have a second one that has a mass of 8 kilograms. And the force of gravity on 8 kilograms would be 78.48 newtons. And those are both in the downward direction. So here's the question. If the top weight is hooked, let's say, to the ceiling or to some kind of stand. And the second one is hooked to the first one. And we have strings here. What is the tension in the string? You could pause the video and see if you can figure it out. OK, so once again, I have a force of gravity on this block. I'm going to call it 50 newtons just for ease of doing some math. So this has a downward pull of 50. To hold it up, there must be an upwards pull of 50. So the tension here, the tension here is a force of 50 newtons in the string. 
The second block, it needs to support the weight of both of them. So here we actually have a total downward force. I'll get around this off to 80 newtons just for some easy math. So this has a weight of 80, this one here, but it's also being pulled down through tension in the string of 50. Because remember, the tension in the string is, is equivalent. So there's going to be a downward force right here, a total downward force of 130 newtons, which means that the force of tension in this rope or string up at the top is 130 newtons. Summertime, we're laying outside on a hammock and it's got four corners on it. And each of the corners has a string or a rope that's attached is up to here and they all knot together. And then we've got one rope going to the top. Let's say the person laying in the hammock is 85 kilograms of mass. I want to know what is the force of tension in each of these strings? I also want to know what is the force of tension in the big rope at the top. We're going to make a few assumptions. First of all, let's assume that the string is weightless. Otherwise, this part here has to hold up these four strings, which adds to the weight. But we're going to just assume that they don't have any weight. We just want to deal with the, the person in the hammock here. So they have a mass of 85 kilograms. That gives us a gravitational force of 833.85 Newtons, which I've drawn here in my free body diagram. The green rope must be providing an upward force, and that upward force must be equivalent to the force being pulled down, 834 Newtons because the string, the rope, and the hammock and everything doesn't have, uh, doesn't have the mass to it. Next up is how much do each of those pieces have? Well, each of those strings will have, assuming that each of the pieces of the hammock are equally weighted, um, you know, there's not one long string and short strings. That would change things. But each of those strings would have a force of approximately 208 newtons on each of them. And that is our tension in that string. And remember that the tension along that string, everywhere along that string is going to be the same. And that's because we're dealing with a weightless rope which is impossible to have. We can also look at tension in a string that is horizontal to the surface, not just the up, down, hanging weights. Here we have a three kilogram mass being dragged across the surface. We have a coefficient of friction of 0 0.2. And I want to know what is the tension on the rope that causes a constant speed? First thing, of course, draw my free body diagram. Now I need to identify our forces. So here we have a force of gravity, and it's going to equal 24, sorry, 29.43 newtons. I have my normal force equal, opposite direction, straight up, 29.43 newtons. Now what I can do is multiply that by my coefficient of friction, and I'll find that my frictional force is 5.886 Newtons. Since I have constant speed over here, what that's telling me is that my applied force has to equal my frictional force. 
So I have 5.886 newtons in this direction. And that will be equal to my force of tension. So the force of tension in the string will be 5.886 newtons. So now I want us to imagine, I've got a little train here, and I have a string attached to two weights, and I'm gonna pull them along. I wanna know, what is the tension in the strings? My cars, I've got two carts, I call them M1, M2. And in green, I've got a string connecting them. And then I have another string where I applied some force. I want to draw my free body diagrams. So this cart has a downward force due to gravity, 10.791, I'll call that 10.8 Newtons. The other cart, also has a downward force of 10.8 newtons. They are a force of gravity. I'll call them force of gravity one and force of gravity two. We have an equal and opposite force, my normal force. I'll call them force normal one and force normal two. Once again, they have to be equal and opposite in direction to the gravitational forces. And if they weren't, then they would either float off into space or the table would crash. Next, there's a little bit of friction when I pull these. There's something holding it back a little bit. If there was no friction, they would slide quite smoothly. And therefore, because it didn't accelerate, this force here is my applied force. This is my tension right here. Here I have a force of friction. Here I have a force of tension. The only force that this frictional force has to overcome is the friction. The only thing holding it back is the friction of this one cart. Cart two, it was actually the one in front. It has two forces of friction it's overcoming. It needs to overcome the frictional force of its own cart plus the frictional force of the other cart. So that this force here has to be a bigger force. So the tension in this string is bigger than the tension in that string. Here we have two blocks tied together with a string. One block weighs five kilograms and the other block weighs eight kilograms. And they are being pulled with another string by a force of 40 newtons. What we'd like to know is what is the tension in both strings? For me, I'm gonna start, I mean, this one's really easy. We are using a force of 40 newtons on this string. That force is being used to pull everything that's coming behind it. So tension two here is simply 40 newtons. Now there's some mathematical ways of figuring it out, but that's pretty straightforward because I told you before is that the force along the string does not change. So that's going to be consistent. To find the other one, what we need to do is we're going to start by finding the acceleration of the system. What we know is that F net is equal to the mass times the acceleration. And the mass that we're going to use is the total mass. So the total mass would be five kilograms plus eight kilograms. So that's 13 kilograms of mass. So F net divided by the mass total Look at us the acceleration. So our acceleration is equal to 40 newtons divided by 13 
kilograms. We have an acceleration here. 3.08 meters per second squared. I want us to keep in mind, if this block moves one meter, this block has to move one meter. And if it moves one meter in three seconds, this one moves one meter in three seconds. The acceleration in both blocks is the same. So the acceleration here, 3.08, meters per second squared, acceleration in this one, 3.08 meters per second squared. The acceleration needs to be the same because we have a system here. They are both moving equally. Now what we can do is we can separate the two blocks and say, so what's going on with this first block? So the first block has a mass of five kilograms and we can figure out the force of tension that helps move it. So we take the five kilograms and multiply it by the mass. So once again, we're just using our F is MA formula, Newton's second law. And we take five times 3.08. We end up with 15.4 Newtons. That's this force right here. 15.4 newtons in the right direction. Just so you can see it, this is pushing that way with a force of 15.4 newtons as well. Just remember along this string, the tension does not change. Similar question. This time I put four cars together. I've made each of them equal to the same mass, but they don't need to be. So we have four cars that each weigh two kilograms, or have a mass of two kilograms, and we're applying a force of 100 newtons. What is the force of tension in each of these strings? Well, once again, this one right here is really easy. That one is 100 newtons. That's number four, okay? Each of them, as we go along, will get smaller and smaller. I'm gonna start by finding our acceleration of the system. Once again, F is MA. So our acceleration is equal to uh, the mass, or sorry, the force divided by the mass. So our acceleration is 100 newtons divided by the total mass, which is eight kilograms. Our acceleration here is 12.5 meters per second squared. Once again, that's for all of them. The acceleration here does not change. Every one of them accelerates, they move, they speed up, they do everything together because it's one continuous system. So if I was to look now at this first car way over here on the left, let's just call this, I'll call this M1, the tension in the string right here, or here, is just enough to move this one car. So the force needed to do that, the force of tension, is mass times acceleration. So that would be 2 times 12.5. So that takes 25 newtons of force to move this one car. So this tension right here, T1, force of tension 1, this is 25 newtons. T2, on the other hand, is moving both of these. T2 needs to move both of those. So the force of T2, once again, it's mass times acceleration. But this time we have a mass of 4 kilograms multiplied by 12.5 newtons. And that will equal 50 newtons of force. So T2 here, this is 50 newtons of force. T3 has to move all three of these. So the force of tension number three, once again, it's mass times acceleration. This time we have six kilograms 
moving at 12.5 meters per second square. Let's see, I put my wrong unit in right there. Let's fix that while we're at it. So now I have six times 12.5. 75 newtons of force. So as we get closer to the applied force here, the total applied force is 100, and you'll see it gets a little bigger as we work across.